The devil controls roulette results. What, have we gone mad? Actually, no. As far as we are concerned, the devil is a fictional character, but you might have heard roulette being referred to as the devil's game. We originally thought it might be because roulette is devilishly hard to beat, but there is a lot more to it than that. The devil is associated with the number 666, and this number crops up in a surprising number of ways within the realm of roulette. And more importantly, it gives us a basis for making predictions. There are a few fun facts you might already know about the number 666 and roulette, so let's just have a peek at them before we get into the more interesting stuff. Firstly, if you watched our Hidden Patterns video part two, then around the 24 minute mark, you might have noticed there are exactly 666 ways to create a set of two pockets to bet on. I guess that may be of some importance if you are trying to design some form of betting strategy based around small bets with far reaching progression levels, but that's not everyone's cup of tea. A second fun fact is if you add up the numeric value of each pocket, then guess what? You've got it. The pockets all add up to 666. Isn't that fun? But hang on a minute. If we can push our sarcastic undertone to one side for a bit, then that last fun fact might actually be really important to us. In any game of roulette, the pockets win in a seemingly random fashion. As you can see, this chart is a flattened version of the wheel with the zero in the centre and the bars showing how many wins each pocket has had. Whilst wins are important, it's actually the loss levels that can tell us more about how a game is running. So, think about loss levels for a minute. For every winning pocket, there are 36 pockets with an incrementing loss level. When you start a session, the pockets already have loss levels. But unless you've been monitoring the wheel for a while before you started, or have looked back at the wheel's recent history data, then you don't know much about the pocket's current state. Let's say you start a new session, and you observe the zero winning on your first spin. What do you think about the other pockets? Do you consider them as having a loss level of one from your perspective? If that's the case, then the total loss value of all pockets combined would only be 36. That's hardly realistic. In a live game, some of those pockets may not have landed for well over 100 spins, and as pockets cannot lose forever, then loss level data carries a lot of information about the session you are playing. Let's change the chart order so the pockets are in numerical order, so this next bit is easier to explain. So, Zero has one win over here, and its loss level has been set to zero with the 36 other pockets now having a loss level of one. We can see our simulator is showing one spin and a total loss of 36. Let's assume a perfect world where every pocket takes its turn of winning in order. So, for the second result, pocket one would win. We can see zero and one both have a win over here. Pocket zero has a loss level of one, pocket one has a loss level of zero, and all the other pockets are at loss level two. You can see what happens as we inch forward through a few more spins. OK, it makes a pretty pattern, but let's just fast forward until each pocket has had a win. So, we end up with 666 again, which might seem fairly obvious now, as we know all the pocket values added up to 666. So playing through each pocket in order gives the zero pocket a loss value of 36, and of course, pocket 36 now has a loss value of zero. This should tell you something important. The minimum possible total loss value or TLV for all pockets at any point in a game is 666. You cannot get a value less than this, unless of course, like in our example, you started counting the loss levels of all pockets from zero at the beginning of your session. This is a really important point to establish. So at the risk of boring you, we are going to run another example. To do this, we're going to put the chart back to having zero in the center and join a simulated game at spin 160. The game is at a point where all pockets have had at least one win, so we know the actual current loss level of all pockets, and you can see the TLV is 1,262. We're going to run another 37 spins. These numbers are in a random order, but they are not random in themselves. We have made sure there are no repeat values, and therefore each pocket will have its rightful win. You can see it doesn't matter what the existing TLV is in any game or in what order the pockets win. If every pocket wins exactly once in any 37 consecutive spins, then the total loss value will reach its lowest point of 666. Considering the pockets all have an equal chance of winning, 
you might expect to see the total loss value reach its minimum fairly often, but in reality, it's probably never happened or ever will. In any batch of 37 spins, you will find there is only about two-thirds of the pockets in play, so about 12 or 13 pockets are usually missing from the results. If we go back and look at the first 37 spins of the simulation, then you will see at spin 37, there was actually 15 pockets with no wins, 11 pockets with one win, 8 pockets had received 2 wins, a couple of pockets had 3 wins, and the number 15 had 4 wins. To highlight this point, let's have a quick look at a number of examples. You can see the average number of pockets missing from these examples is 13. You can understand how this fact might help. Why not try this for yourself next time you play? Just keep a count of the winning pockets for any 37 spins at any point in any game and see how many pockets are asleep. So even if you observe thousands of spins over hundreds of games, the total loss value of your sessions is unlikely to knock on the devil's door. But how does this help us make profitable predictions? Let's find out. We hypothesize that pockets cannot lose forever, so their individual loss values must contain important information, and of course they coincide with the total loss value at any point in the game. We have firmly established what the minimum total value can be, so is there a maximum value it can reach? Is there such a thing as a heavenly number, perhaps? If we could work out a maximum theoretical value, then we could calculate an average value which would tell us a lot about the current state of the game. This knowledge could give us insight as to when the pockets with the highest current loss might start winning, or perhaps indicate when we are more likely to experience winning pockets repeating. Albert Einstein was quoted as saying, the only way to beat roulette is to steal the money when the dealer's not looking. But in fairness to this iconic genius, he never had the luxury of a computer system to run billions of simulations like so many of today's statisticians using the famous Monte Carlo method. This technique dates back to the 1940s, when mathematician and physicist Stanislaw Ulam realised running many simulations of a given model using random data produced reliable results. Collaborating with John von Neumann, the term Monte Carlo was chosen as a code name for a wartime project because of Ulam's recollection of the Monte Carlo Casino generating large amounts of random data on a daily basis with its roulette wheels. Fast forward to now, and harnessing the brute force power of computer simulations to get answers is easy. So that's exactly what we have done using 200,000 spins worth of simulated data. The data is divided into equal sessions of 1,000 spins. Instead of using all the data, we are ignoring the first 200 spins from each session. Like the earlier example, we are effectively joining the game at a point where most of the pockets will have had at least one win. There might be a few sessions where the odd pocket hasn't yet won, but it's not enough to affect our results by much. In just a few lines of code aimed at a large chunk of data, the answers appear in seconds. Here is a sample of the spin data. You can see it is showing session 1 of the 200 sessions, and it's starting from spin 201 as we are ignoring the first 200 spins. You can see the pocket that won and the total loss value for the spin. The TLV up and down are counting how many times in a row the TLV went up or increased in value, or how many times the TLV went down and decreased in value. The last column shows how many pockets had no wins in a rolling last 37 spins, just like we saw earlier. There are many more fields than that in the table, but that's all we are concerned with for this video. The section below shows the total rows available, which as we said is 200,000. At the bottom you can see we processed 160,000 spins, which is the last 800 spins from each of the 200 sessions. And of course, the results we are actually looking for. The lowest TLV is a fair bit higher than 666, which you might have expected, now that we know there's little chance of all pockets getting a win in 37 spins. There is a first look at a possible maximum TLV, or heavenly number, and we now have a fairly accurate average value. Going back to the chart, we can add lines for the lowest TLV, the average TLV, and the highest TLV. As the saying goes, it's better the devil you know. The 200,000 spins we sampled are significant, but not exhaustive, so there is a margin of error between the lowest TLV and the devil we know. Maybe we should consider similar for the top of our chart, perhaps revealing the address of Heaven's Gate. So let's add a similar margin, rounding it up to a nice even 2,200. And just when you thought old Dev has done enough for us, he appears again, this time with both hands on the wheel, pun intended. We catch him steering the game via the average TLV, which is 666 times 2. Freaky. 
If you've made it this far into the video, you are just about to find out how the boundaries and constraints enforced during a live roulette game can help us perform many useful calculations to spot lucrative betting opportunities. As we have seen in previous videos, monitoring data and looking for outliers can be used to make profitable predictions. The more significant the outliers are, the more accurate the prediction. This is also true of the TLV data, as the total loss value approaches the established constraints, then it becomes more useful in a number of ways. The topic has become too big to cover in one video, so we're going to finish here with a simplified explanation of the areas where TLV data can help. We will produce a few more videos to cover this topic with the detail it deserves. 1. TLV data to some extent is like an overview of the game, so it can underpin the accuracy of other data views, giving insight as to when you might need to wait for bigger outliers. 2. When TLV data reaches its highs or lows, it can indicate when cold numbers will return to play, or when hot numbers will remain hot. 3. Similar to point two, this same technique also applies to sets of pockets, for example, indicating when perhaps a set might run cold or stay hot for a bit longer. Four, tracking the average TLV even when it's running close to expectation can help you understand how a particular set might perform in relation to its peers within any group of sets. In the earlier examples, we looked at counting loss levels starting at zero or we implied you need to wait for a large number of spins to understand where all the pockets are currently at. Nobody wants to waste time monitoring a few hundred spins when you might only intend to play for, say, 50 spins, so there is a simple, effective way around this. Now that we know what the average TLV should be, you can simply assume at the start of a session all pockets have a loss value of 36, then just processing 10 to 15 spins at the beginning of the game will give you accurate enough TLV data to get up and running fast. One last thought. It said the devil is in the detail, so let's consider the 37 pockets times table, where we soon discover that 666 appears yet again. Perhaps the devil is real after all. To be on the safe side, we suggest you subscribe to this channel and like this video. <laughs>